Hello, Biology 182 lab students. We'll be discussing the Survey of the Plant Kingdom Lab 30 in your lab text found on page 321. The gymnosperms. These are the cone-bearing seed plants. The few groups, the cycads, are also known as the king palms. Our ponderosa pine, which we're familiar with up here in the Flagstaff Mountain campus. The conifers, pine trees, fir trees, and ginkgo biloba, one of my favorite tree names to say. In summary, gymnosperms are a group of cone-bearing vascular plants who arose 360 million years ago from a spore plant ancestor and mark the evolution of seeds. These plants rose to dominance in primitive forests as the climate became drier during the Triassic 200 million years ago. Seeds and pollen enabled gymnosperms to outcompete ferns and club mosses in dry environments. Sexual reproduction was possible without water, and offspring could remain dormant within seeds until conditions were optimal for growth. These plants produce male and female spores, which develop into gametophytes protected within cones. Sex occurs when the male gametophytes, or pollen, travel via wind from male to female cones, and then reach awaiting eggs with the aid of pollen tubes. Gymnosperms have important economic and ecological roles, including wood production and providing habitat for arboreal organisms. To the right, we can see a video. It's a summary of what gymnosperms are. We can see a pine seed and a pine cone that isn't quite matured yet and still green. Here are your objectives for your test. Number one, what features do all gymnosperms share? Two, what features distinguish each phylum? Three, what are the main events in the alternation of generations life cycle of these naked seed plants? Four, how does the life cycle of gymnosperms differ from that of spore plants, vascular and non-vascular? I should probably specify on the last point, naked seed. Gymnosperm means naked seed. I wasn't making, like, any kind of inappropriate comment. Five, what are the different parts of a cone? What is the adaptive function of a cone? Six, what are the different parts of a seed? What is the adaptive function of seeds? And seven, what are the adaptations of conifera phyta to cold, dry environments? Now we're looking at our cladogram of plants. We can see the ancestral traits of gymnosperms. So they have all plant traits except flowers. That's what separates angiosperms and gymnosperms. They have a sporophyte dominant life cycle, simpler, simple vascular tissue, and roots take a look at our cladogram, we can see our green algae group. And they have things like simple gametangia, retention of egg on the parent, those kind of things. But one thing to note uh, with, with gymnosperms, they have all of these wonderful adaptations. So they have complex gametangia, alternation of generations, retention of embryo on the parent, sporophyte dominated life cycle, Heterospores, so they have two different kinds of spores, spores. They develop pollen, and then they have seeds. Seeds are quite, quite a lovely mechanical uh, breakthrough in plant technology. Only 800 species of gymnosperms remain, and they fall into four phyla we're going to go over today. The netophytes, cycads, ginkgos, and conifers. And ginkgos are restricted to one species, ginkgo biloba. What are the evolutionary adaptations in gymnosperms? Well, one, they have microgametophytes. That's pollen. Pollen is a gametophyte. It's not just a sperm cell that no longer require water to reach and fertilize the egg. They can use wind and other means of dispersal via animals. Two, they have successful seeds. So seeds that arise in the fern lineages but die out. And then they have secondary growth. This leads to wood and bark. We can see in the bottom left-hand corner some really big gymnosperms, the sequoias and giant redwoods. In the bottom right, we can see an SEM 
we're scanning electron micrograph of a pollen grain that has wings on it to float in the wind. The gymnosperms are the naked seed plants. So their seeds are naked. They do not have a protective fruit. Although they can be eaten, they still don't have a fruit around them. They have pollen and pollination, so that transports the sperm from the male to female cones via wind and somewhat via gravity. The pollen tube is a tube that delivers the sperm from the pollen grain to the egg within the female cone, enabling fertilization. So that's sex. The male and female gametophytes are... The female gametophyte is an egg, and the male gametophyte is the pollen. Spores are not released, but retained in the cones for female gametophytes. This ensures the survival of the gametophytes that produce the vital sex organs and gametes. So we can see in our top right diagram, we can see an open cone, we see ripened seeds, and the seeds sit on something called a cone scale. And then we have a closed cone, an immature cone, typically they're green. We see the cone scale and the immature seeds, they're not nearly as big. We can see the cone scale with the seeds, and then the pollen cones in the bottom right, and that cloud of orange next to them are all the pollen flying away from the male cones. How do seeds get around once they've been fertilized? Well, of course, they're going to be dispersed by wind, so they can have little wings on them, and wing seeds. And of course, a lot of animals. There are certain birds called crossbills that are like large finches with these funny crossed bills that are designed specifically for removing cone seeds out of gymnosperm cones. And of course our little chipmunk there, or ground squirrel, is able to do the same thing. The seed can remain dormant. That is the mechanical advantage to having a seed. It is protected and can remain dormant until there is sufficient moisture and light for germination and growth. Dispersal enables less competition between parent and offspring. So the seeds can get to a nice open spot and not have to compete with their own parent. And the seeds do have some stored energy for the embryo to grow during germination. So we have the food store, we have the seed coat around there, and then the little embryo that's going to use that food store to grow its leaves. In previous phyla of plants, we discussed homosporous states, where the spores are all the same, whether they come from male or female. Gymnosperms have heterosporous development. It produces two types of spores. A female has what's called a megaspore. It's very large, uh, sometimes a centimeter in length. Call it a megagametophyte, and it's the egg. The male has a microspore. We call that the microgametophyte, and it has sperm in it. And the sperm is inside the pollen, the pollen being the microgametophyte. And then when they unite, that makes a seed, which is now diploid. What do the male cones produce? Well, they make pollen. And that's the male gametophyte, microgametophyte. Remember, it's not just a sperm. There's more to it than that. Let's take a look at a male cone cross-section. The male spores, or microspores, develop in sacs called microsporangia within male cones. Then pollen forms. And pollen comes off the male cones. The microspore grows into a male gametophyte, or pollen grain, and then comes off. And they have these, quote, wings that are able to be carried in the wind. Then the wind carries them and pollination occurs inside the female cone. Pollen grain travels from male to female cone, leading to pollination. Fertilization occurs once the sperm penetrates the female cone and unites with the egg via a pollen tube. So we can see the male cone that's landed in the appropriate place, and with the gametophyte, the female gametophyte, it grows a pollen tube. And then that penetrates inside the egg and delivers the sperm. 
And the sperm then can fertilize the egg, making a seed. And that seed is surrounded by an ovule. The female cones produce the ovules and the eggs. The ovules contain the female gametophyte, the egg, the megagametophyte, which produces the egg. So we can see in the bottom left-hand diagram of a cone, we can see the cone scales in cross-section. The two ovules develop at the base of the cone scale. The ovule then produces a megaspore, which develops into the megagametophyte. We can see the female gametophyte, the archegonia, integument, needles, and ovule containing the gametophyte. And that goes to the megagametophyte that produces the egg. There are two ovules within each gametoph megagametophyte on every scale. So, so we have two ovules, two megagametophytes on every scale. Thus, after fertilization, two seeds form on each scale, seen in that picture above there. A couple of terms you'll need to know, monoecious versus dioecious, and we see these in plants. Monoecious means it's a hermaphrodite. The plant contains both male and female sex organs. Think one house, mono equals one. We can see pines have both male and female cones on one tree. Another name, again for cones, is stroboli. Or strobilus is singular. Dioecious separate male and female plants with their respective sex organs. Think two houses. Di means two. So we see the female cone in the cycad, and they have a separate male plant that produces male cones. What are the two types of growth in plants? Well, there's primary growth. This lengthens the shoots and roots, producing herbaceous, non-woody tissue. This occurs in the apical meristems, which are the red areas, at the root and shoot tips. This is seen in all plants. Secondary growth is when we're widening the trunk and stems by producing wood. It's a secondary xylem, and bark, which is a secondary phloem. This occurs in the secondary meristem, or also known as the vascular cambium. We see this in gymnosperms and dicots. Uh, one thing to look at is the primary growth video to show a plant growing in time-lapse photography. Primary growth occurs in the shoot tips, which is called the apical meristems. So I mentioned the secondary growth occurs at the vascular cambium. This is the site of secondary cell division. So remember, xylem grows inward, phloem grows outward. Question, which plants become woody? Something about being really tall. What is a tree ring? It is a layer of wood produced during one tree's growing season. In early wood, Xylem cells are large, with thin walls. Lots of cells are laid down in spring when water is plentiful. Late wood, the cells become smaller, with thick walls. Fewer cells are laid down in summer when water is less available. So, let's take a look at this. We have, inside of our tree ring, we have the xylem ray and the phloem ray. And then we have what's composed of the bark. In the xylem we have early wood, late wood, we can see the vascular cambium itself, the secondary phloem, and the periderm is composed of cork cambium and cork. That's not used for structural integrity, that's like our skin, for protection against herbivores and parasites. Here's a question. Why would tropical trees lack rings? Hmm. We're going to now get into the gymnosperm phyla. We're going to take a look at cycadophyta, ginkophyta, which is the ginkgo biloba, the uh, pinophyta, or canophora phyta, 
and the Netophyta are the Netophytes. Cycatophyta is an interesting group. They're a very ancient gymnosperm. They have palm-like leaves and are sometimes called the king palms, but they're not a palm at all because a palm would be an angiosperm. We can see they can get as large as trees and a lot of times they're ground-dwelling plants lower to the ground than, say, pine trees are. See at the bottom left we see a female cone, still green, not quite mature yet. And then we see a male cone, and that one looks mature. That makes them dioecious. So one plant doesn't have both a female and male cone. And their cones typically are found in a set centrally located area in between where the palm-like leaves originate from. The cycads are found in tropical and subtropical habitats. We find these a lot down in Florida, uh, planted as ornamental. They're evergreen. Their leaves are somewhat like a feather or pinnate. Uh, they have huge cones that are centrally located. Again, we mentioned they're dioecious. And they have flagellated sperm. You do not need water for fertilization. It's a vestigial trait. And they do have neurotoxins in their seeds and leaves. They arose around 250 million years ago when the age of cycads is when they dominated the landscapes. But there's only around 200 extant species today. Why do you imagine many of these plants only have a few extant species? I would say they were being replaced by something like flowering plants. The ecology of cycads, they're the most threatened with extinction out of all the gymnosperms, 80% listed, listed as threatened. Now, of course, because the rainforests are being deforested at an alarming rate, that's the habitat loss that's really doing them in. But it's also over collection for ornamental plants, as I suggested before. They're insect pollinated, so they have beetles and weevils. Many of these species are very specific to very specific types of cycads. Most gymnosperms use wind for pollination, and that's one of the limiting factors on cycads. They can fix nitrogen with help of cyanobacteria, or nitrogen fixers, in the root system. And this helps create toxic compounds in plants, which deters herbivores from eating them. Seeds are boiled to remove toxins and eaten by some cultures, especially in Brazil and Japan during a famine in the 1920s. Ginkgo phyta is an interesting species and former larger group of gymnosperms. They're dioecious, so they have male cones, but the female cones aren't like you think. They're not really cones. They make these fleshy female parts and it's not the ovulate cone we're used to. They're deciduous. Now many pine trees and other conifers are deciduous as well, but the leaves fall off and fall. They're an ornamental tree, so they're sometimes called the maiden hair tree. But most people remember them as ginkgo biloba because there's an extract thought to increase memory and mental clarity. And they don't have needles or palm-like leaves. They're broad-leafed. Good surface area for doing a lot of photosynthesis. An interesting fact, it was believed that ginkgo, ginkgo fights in general, were extinct. But uh, a few hundred years ago, one population was discovered in a Chinese monastery. Uh, somehow these monks had been taking care of this population of ginkgo fights, or ginkgo biloba, uh, for many of hundreds of years. And then uh, a biologist found them and they became an ornamental success story. Now they're found throughout the world. The traits of ginkgo fights are deciduous broad leafed plants, the female's naked seeds not found in a cone, the seeds are covered with a sticky, fleshy seed coat. They're dioecious, so we have male and female trees, like humans, except we're not trees. And they have flagellated sperm. The male pollen cone, or strobilus, or sometimes called staminate cone, 
it looks quite different than the fleshy female seed coat. It's a living fossil kept alive by Chinese horticulture, as I mentioned before, and they have a huge economic importance for ornamental trees and supplements. A group we're very familiar with here in Flagstaff is the Phylum Pinophyta, or Conifera Phyta. These are the spruces, junipers, pines, and firs. They're monoecious, except for junipers. So they have male and female cones on one tree. They have non-modal sperm, so a pollen tube transports sperm cells down the pollen tube to the egg. They're adapted to drought, so they have very tiny needles. It's less area for water loss via transpiration. And they, of course, have an enormous economic importance of wood being one of the founding reasons why Flagstaff exists in the first place. Paper, resins, turpentine, which is a type of paint thinner, and ornamental trees. People plant blue spruces all over their, their yard and their homes, and biofuels. In the bottom left-hand picture, we can see male fir cones, and before they come out, they can be quite a deep red or pink color. There's a Utah juniper in the middle picture, a giant sequoia with a few people trying to wrap their arms around it. In the top right is a blue spruce. There's a huge diversity in pine cones. In the top left we can see a Douglas fir that has these very specific, kind of spiny-like structures called bracts. But not all of them have cones. Junipers have an interesting berry shape. We have many junipers that grow around Flagstaff. The one seed, Utah and alligator skin juniper are just a few. The coastal redwood, oddly, produces really tiny cones. But if you can imagine, these trees have very thin branches coming off a very large trunk, and they wouldn't want to have a heavy cone like the coulter pine. Now, that can grow up to 10 pounds. They are quite dangerous if you're in the season where coulter pine exists and they are falling off the trees. Um, but the coulter pine has a very large branch system that can support these 10-pound cones. The sugar pine can get very large, but they don't weigh nearly as much. They're a little bit more thinly divided. And then a fir in the bottom left hand, we can see some male cones coming out of a fir tree. The bristle cone pine tree is a very interesting couple of species, Pinus longeva and Pinus aristata. They are very old, and the oldest one found is named Methuselah, and it's 4,844 years. It's the oldest non-clonal tree, which means it is an individual that has lived for that long. They're older than the Egyptian pyramids, Stonehenge, the Great Wall of China. It was already 2,000 years old when the wall was being built. The oldest tree, sadly, was almost 5,000 years, and it was found at Great Basin National Park. It was discovered by the University of Utah, and they originally were taking tree core samples, little tiny holes drilled in the tree, uh, and then they'd pull the core out and count it, not killing the tree. But this particular individual was cut down and they were made, they counted the tree rings and it was the oldest known organism on the planet. Uh, being from Salt Lake City, that's a little embarrassing for me. We can see uh, where these things grow. So Pinus longeva is found throughout Utah and Nevada, but Pinus aristata is actually found here in Flagstaff around the peaks. And it's also found throughout the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and the San Juans as they go down into New Mexico. Here comes a debate. What's the largest organism? There's a fungus that has been cloning itself for a while, and it's linked in its hyphae and covers many square miles. There are aspen groves in Oregon that do the same. They clone themselves and make very large groves in hundreds of square miles. But the Coastal redwoods are the tallest living organism, at 379 feet tall is the tallest one. 
And the giant sequoias are thicker. They're not as tall, but they're thicker. They're 52,508 cubic feet. And it's the largest non-clonal living organism by volume. So the term non-clonal should end the debate there. What's the largest organism on the planet? A lot of people want to say, oh, it's got to be the blue whale. A blue whale is about 110 feet at its longest, not uh, 300 feet long. We devoted a whole slide to the ponderosa pine, also known as Pinus ponderosa. The forest in Flagstaff and along the rim to the White Mountains region is the largest contiguous ponderosa pine forest on the continent. Um, so off to the top right we can see the ponderosa pine. If you're new to Flagstaff, on warm summer days in the sunlight, if you go up to these ponderosa pines and poke your nose in between the, uh, the bark, it does have a nice root beer or vanilla smell. I've smelled a couple that smell like cinnamon, but uh, the root beer is really apparent. Another very common pine tree, Pinus edulis, the two-needle pine, pinion pine tree, uh, seen in the bottom left. They yield pine nuts um, and has been a staple of the Native Americans around here for hundreds of years, even thousands. And of course, they're used, uh, their wood is used for fuel. And then there's a comparison between ovulate and staminate cones. So a female pine cone is ovulate, kind of having an, uh, an oval shape. And then male cone, pine cones are more staminate or layered. Living in northern Arizona, you can guess that many of our conifers are adapted to fire. They've adapted to naturally occurring fire disturbance in their dry ecosystems, typically caused by lightning. They have very thick bark. And this is an adaptation to frequent low-intensity fires that occur on the ground with herbaceous plants. They also have serotonous cones. These cones release seeds only in response to high heat or smoke, usually during standard placing fires. And then the thin bark, an adaptation to infrequent high intensity stand replacing fires. One thing that I was taught as a young student is fires were generally bad. And so huge amounts of energy and money and time went to fighting fires. But then, when I got older, uh, these fires started to become mega fires and burn out of control. That's because there was too much fuel on the ground. So uh, management practices are shifting from preventing fires to allowing these small, uh, low intensity fires. The gymnosperm alternations of generations. We see the sporophyte is dominant in the life cycle. So unlike our bryophytes or our vascular spore plants, the sporophyte is, is uh, dominant in our vascular spore plants, but the gametophyte is also independent. The gametophyte is reduced and it's very microscopic because the spores are retained, thus develop within the parent plant. So in the right-hand picture, we see our seed plants. Gametophyte is blue, and pink is sporophyte. So the sporophyte's the big tree that we're familiar with. And within there is the female, or male, gametophyte. With a dominant sporophyte generation in seeds, plants could better ensure offspring production and survival. The idea is to protect the gametophyte. So, successful sex means that the gametophytes, they're protected in the sporophyte. So, basically, the sporophyte is protecting so that sex happens. The seeds are dispersed instead of spores, enabling the dormancy of the sporophyte generation when needed. So, these two adaptations really led to the success of gymnosperms and then eventually angiosperms. Let's take a look at the pine life cycle. 
So the pink is the diploid phase, the sporophyte, and the haploid phase is in blue, and that's the gametophyte. So let's start with our sporophyte, our large tree that we're used to. We have two cones. We have pollen cones and seed cones, which are male and female, respectively. And then we have the ovule um, inside of that cone. And then inside the pollen cone scale, we see the microsporangium and the microsporocyte. Now, meiosis happens here. And this is where we're going to see pollen grains come from. And this is now the gametophyte generation. We can see in the bottom right hand light micrograph picture pollen grains coming from the megaspore or going to the megaspore. And then once the uh, spores find the megaspore inside the female cone, then this pollen grain germinates and it sends down a pollen tube. This pollen tube grows around the megaspore and um, finds the megagametophyte that has the egg in it. And once that pollen tube is grown, then the sperm follow. And we have a microgametophyte there growing. It is its own organism, but it is dependent on the female megagametophyte to give it nutrients to grow that pollen tube. And then fertilization happens. We're back to a diploid phase and that's a zygote, and it's a fertilized egg. Then the seed begins to grow. We have some stored food, a seed coat, and an embryo. And then the seed can pop out and be dispersed by animals. It has a wing, so it can also be dispersed by wind, so it can go farther away from the sporophyte that it came from. And then once the conditions are right, the sporophyte begins to grow and make a small tree. In summary, the gymnosperm life cycle, one, starts out with pollination. Wind disperses pollen to ovulate female cones. Pollen grains stick to the resin at the opening to the ovules, where the female gametophyte is. Two, waits. So the pollen waits until the female gametophyte, the archegone, is mature at one year. Three, the pollen tube forms to transport the non-modal sperm to the egg exclamation point for fertilization. The pollen tube penetrates the ovule and releases the sperm, creating a diploid zygote. Finally! Seed forms. The diploid embryo develops and the seed matures. And then seed dispersal. The wind disperses the wing seeds to a new habitat, or of course animals, by eating them like the crossbill I mentioned before. When conditions are right, it germinates. The resulting seedling is a new sporophyte generation. Our last group we'll be discussing are the netophytes in the phylum Netophyta. There are some desert species like Wilwichia or Wilwichia found in the Namib Desert. There are some tropical species. And the one we find around Flagstaff is Ephedra. It's also known as Mormon tea or Brigham tea. It's because it does have ephedrine inside of it, and the Mormon pioneers were said to chew that in the morning so that they could get up quicker and move faster across the plains during their migration. In the top right, we see um, two types of vascular cells. So we see the vessel member here with the trachea vessel. And then off to the right, we also have a tracheid, which is a little different. And we can see how water and uh, other minerals can move up uh, with this advanced vascular cell. The traits of netophytes are, well, one, there's only three genera known. Two, they appeared possibly as early as the Permian around 250 million years ago. They have flower-like cones, at least on the ephedra genre that we find here in North America. We mentioned that they have advanced vascular cells. They're heterosporous, so they have male and female uh, spores. The sperm lack flagella. They're dioecious, so we'll see male plants and female plants. And then, of course, for the economical importance, this is where we developed 
ephedrine from, which is a commonly used drug to uh, cure headaches and other types of pain. Off to the right, we can see our netum, not found here in North America. Then we see uh, ephedra with those little tiny flower-like cones. And then Welwitchia, which is a very unique plant that can go many years without uh, growing in the absence of water. And then when it rains, it begins blossoming and uh, growing immediately to make as many of its offspring as it can. Well, Wichia is a really interesting plant, as I mentioned, found in the Namib Desert. Um, Namibia is one of the driest countries on Earth. It's found uh, near South Africa on the Atlantic coast. It has only two continuously growing leaves. They weather into various strips that curl on the top of each other, with the older cells dying off. They're living fossils. Some organisms may be over 2,000 years old. And they obtain moisture from incoming fog from the ocean. So they have adaptations for collecting fog rather than having to deal with uh, rain. Did it? 